ist schon ganz schön lang unterwegs. Beim 33 C3, da fuhr er mit Xerox ab. Beim 33 C3 hat er dann Spiegel einmal gedatamined und hat geguckt, was ist denn dort Spiegel Online und hat uns wirklich eine total perfekte Datenanalyse zu dem Thema gemacht. Und beim 36 C3 geht es mit dieser Zugfahrt weiter. Bitte begrüßt mit einem riesen Applaus David Kriesel. Please welcome with a huge applause David Kriesel. Viel Spaß. Have fun. Also ich glaube, um, so geil bin ich noch niemals eingeleitet worden. I think this was the best introduction I've ever received. Ja, herzlich willkommen. Welcome everybody and welcome everybody in the stream and uh, welcome to the aluminium foil hat wearers. But they're not glowing yet, so maybe we can change that during this presentation. I'm David Kriesel, I'm a computer scientist from Bonn and uh, in real life it's my job to make large amounts of data understandable and uh, to find interesting things in it. Um, usually they call it data scientist now. In addition to my job, I have various pro projects and hobbies and uh, sometimes I take one of those and turn it into a talk like this. In Rhineland, where I'm from, we say twice is a tradition and three times or more it becomes a custom. So now this has become a custom and uh, I'm happy to be here again. Our story begins in the year 2018. At the end of 2018, Deutsche Bahn said around 75% of its long-distance trains were on time. And for that, we first need to know, what does it mean to be on time? The Deutsche Bahn calculates this as follows. They say that if a train arrives less than six minutes late at a stop, it is considered to be on time. That is the definition. And then they calculate the percentage of all stops where that is the case. And uh, that's the case in about 75% of cases in 2018. And that didn't match my personal experience at all and that uh, distracted me. In the recent years, I've traveled across Germany very often by train. And then I checked my mailbox, and for more than half of my trips, I've received an email from delay alarm at bahn.de. And then I thought, I'm probably that guy who has to be careful not to be struck by lightning while winning the lottery. I wanted to explore this in more detail, so I checked the statistics on the webpage of Deutsche Bahn and then I saw there are hardly any. The Deutsche Bahn only offers the percent of punctual stops per month for the entire railway network, separated by uh, long distance and regional trains. You can't filter anything, you can't sort by train station. All the interesting things are the ones that I would find interesting. They're not possible. So on January 8th, I started stockpiling Deutsche Bahn data. And this is the data set we're looking at today. We not only evaluate, but I will also spend a little time to explain roughly how to approach such a data project and also how you can uh, tell whether you can have confidence in the data. And throughout the lecture, I will always give you free practical tips that you can take home and uh, that you can think of when you are booking a train ride. Disclaimer, I did not talk to the Deutsche Bahn about the evaluations. Always keep in mind, at the end, this is a small hobby project, as always. And uh, it may well be that I made mistakes. So now let's take a look and then you can decide for yourself whether you can trust my data or not. So here we see a fictitious ICE connection. I'll give you a few seconds to, uh, for a first overview and then I'll explain more. Three seconds are enough. The ICE starts in Munich and every further row is a stop. And at some point he got here 
in Rügen. A, a trip is a sequence of all stops that the train makes from start to finish. Here are the delays per stop. The train left six minutes late according to the measurement of Deutsche Bahn. This would be considered too late, just too late. And then the delays fluctuate. In Erfurt we were six minutes early. The delay is negative. Usually this means that the train just stayed at the station for longer and didn't leave earlier. Uh, we don't stop at Berlin Airport. Maybe in 20 years I can still make these jokes. <laughs> And these stops of all trips are the basis of our date. My table has 25 million rows. That's 25 million stops of some trains. These are all long-distance stops from January 8th until now. And also local transport, but only at long-distance serving stations. And it has different columns, the one that I'm showing here, and a few more. We can look into individual places, look at individual trips, look into the exact time periods, and also carry out complex evaluations. That's what we're also going to do today. At the beginning, however, we do some very simple things with the data. This is not to bore you, but we have to get to know the data set to get an overview first. So we sort the entire table of stops uh, by train stations, and then we determine the number of stops for each station throughout the entire year. Each bubble is a long-distance train station. We have 350 of them. And the size of the bubble reflects the number of stops recorded for the station. For everything that goes there, the long distance and local transport. The biggest in terms of that is Cologne Main Station with 380,000 stops. I've labeled the top six stations on the map. Why exactly those? Because the sixth station is exactly Hamburg Damtor, and um, I didn't want to keep this from you. That's where the Congress used to be. Uh, by the way, the Leipzig Messe train station is significantly smaller, including local transport. We have about 60,000 stops per year. While we're at it, we can do something new that is uh, interesting from a customer's point of view. So, so we. So this is the, this is, this is the punctuality. 60% is bright red, and roughly 75 is white, the alleged average. So we see in Germany almost everything is blue. In eastern Germany, everything is blue. It must be the blooming landscape is that Chancellor Kohl always spoke of. In Northern Australia, almost everything is red. Cologne only has about 66% functionality. Bonn is really one of the worst spots at 59%, which other stations I usually go through. In general, the entire density populated area in North Rhine-Westphalia is pretty bad. And I told you I had started this whole project only because the statistics of the DB must be incorrect, but the fact is I just live in a bad spot. Hamburg up there is also bad. I, th I think it's justice. Why should I be the only one to suffer? Somewhere around 60%. In fact, it looks more red than it is because it's transparent plotting. In terms of punctuality, in Leipzig, we're pretty good at 80% or more. Very important. From now on, all the stops that I'm showing will be only long-distance transport. This whole talk, in fact, will be only about long-distance transport because that's what most of the media will be talked about the most. If I say that I mostly talk about long-distance transport, I have to be fair and I say also it does actually get completely, well, almost completely, punctuality values over 90%. Please keep that in mind for the rest. These trains have good size and they bring a lot of, number of, a lot of people to their job every day. I hope everyone from the DB are listening and have heard this. So we'll change the view. Functionality per train stations was interesting per, uh, for the customer, but if you want to do something better at the trains, at the DB, 
then we want to see which train stations generate delays. And this is this view. The worst is big train stations with many stops, who, after every train that stops, they give all of the other trains a little bit of delay. The worst one is Hamburg, Cologne, Frankfurt Airport, and Mannheim. All of these came up with more than 50,000 delay minutes that they added to the transport. And the worst one is Frankfurt Main Station with more than 93,000 minutes of delay. Who came from Frankfurt? How did you get here? They probably got here today. I hope you didn't, I hope you didn't have to hurry too much. However, there's also train stations that work so well that they in overall take away delays from the network. The best of these were Bremen, Berlin, and Berlin, well, Berlin Main Station, Berlin Spandau. This surprised me. Out of the blue, a proof of this magnitude, something about Berlin actually works. I did not expect this. But we'll see the we'll see the comparison. So now we compare how many stops we have from short distance trains and from long distance trains, and we can see that most of the trains here are uh, regional trains, and there's also uh, trains provided by other companies than Deutsche Bahn, and we filter this uh, before we really start. Um, so here you see the regional trains which are split into the um, into these three main types and I will use the following abbreviations you see here during the talk and these uh, comparatively small uh, blue dots uh, these are the ones that are interesting these go all throughout Germany um, we take these for us interesting uh, train types and then we check which type of train is usually the most late. So this means uh, trains that are more than six minutes late. The most punctual are intercity with about 66%. Not even 70% uh, of the ECs are punctual according to the definition of the Deutsche Bahn. And um, I can confirm this, uh, the quality of these trains is overall much worse, even uh, from the inside, it, they look quite old. But they are obviously international because they're Euro city trains and uh, they might uh, actually import delay from uh, other countries. And there's another type of delay that we can measure, but the Deutsche Bahn is uh, keeping silent about it. But uh, of course, that uh, means that you're basically just applying to be analyzed by me. And that is uh, the percentage of train cancellations. I see these are the flagship of the uh, German railway system. and. Um, apparently, they are the most common to be cancelled by far. Eurocity about 2%, Intercity over 3%, and ICE over 5%. So if you're booking an ICE, then in one of 20 cases, it's just not going to arrive. And I thought that was pretty tough. So my practical tip for you is, be careful with ICE trains. I fairly point out again, this is an evaluation from the outside. So that is a, there's a possibility that this is not correct and um, that other trains might have replaced these. But uh, in their data, these were marked explicitly as cancelled. And in uh, Spiegel, they also had an analysis uh, recently which uh, came to a similar conclusion. So we just assume that this is about correct. One of the highest delays was from Stuttgart to Hamburg in October 2019. The train had 400, over 400 minutes of delay. That's more than seven and a half hours. And it was not cancelled. And to complete our overview, uh, we will now look at this distributed by time. 
These are all the long distance connections I have. Uh, we have about 800 journeys a day. Uh, the ones on Fridays are usually uh, a bit higher, the ones on Saturdays are usually a bit lower. Um, and what can you see as well? For example, you can see that I messed up in between and lost a few days of data. Um, <laughs> this happens every time. But but this time I built a download monitoring and I thought I was so cool um, but then apparently I crashed that server and it didn't even respond anymore I had to do a hard reset but I was uh, on vacation and I didn't notice so technical tip for you don't only build a download monitoring, but also monitor it from the outside. So if the entire server crashes, you still notice. So, uh, since Bahn applied to be checked uh, for the cancellations, we will look at this a bit uh, more detailed now. And these spikes... Uh, uh, Hurricane Eberhard on the 10th of March and, and uh, in the evening the storm had the opinion it's enough with train traffic. So uh, this is the hottest day of the heat wave this year and uh, there you can also notice that the train cancellations are much more frequent in summer. Why is that? Uh, that is because of the climate uh, machines, the air conditioning inside the trains. And uh, now we look at the failures per week according to train type. And then you can see really how huge the problem of ICE air conditioning really is because compared to the other types of trains, they actually uh, have an even more increased failure rate. Um, so when it's warm, every 12th ICE is just cancelled. In the week of the 22nd of July, more than 10% of all ICE stops failed. I don't know what you feel when you hear this, but this is... Uh, uh, for me, goes beyond uh, fault tolerance. So my practical tip for you is be careful with ICs in the summer. Now that it gets colder, it starts uh, again. But uh, we still have to um, wait and see uh, when it gets really cold whether this is actually true. So we do two little things now, and then we'll talk about how to set up a project like this and the basic rules. Something obvious, I've sorted the stops according to the time the train journey took before these stops. So from left to right, the already running uh, time of the train increases. So earlier, um, the trains are... So sh when it has only uh, traveled a short distance, it is more punctual. And the longer it travels, the less punctual it becomes. Why do I say this? Um, I want to protect the Bahn a little bit here, because in the media, you can, uh, you can uh, hear in the media that uh, there are some really, really big problems with punctuality between large cities. Um, and the the issues with the uh, fast trains between uh, in Japan, between the large cities, there's uh, not really a comparison to be made here because Deutsche Bahn has to share its rails and um, in Japan they control everything that uh, goes on the rails. Um, my practical tip to you from here is be careful with trains that have already uh, had a long journey. Next I ask myself, after which delay does it not get any better? So I check for every stop how late is the train already. So from left to right, left the le le um, less uh, delayed stops, right 
the more delay it stops. Then I checked how many percent actually um, reduce their delay by 5%, but still run and are not cancelled. Uh, so what you can see here, if there's a delay of less than 40 minutes, then uh, it's okay, but uh, after 40 minutes, uh, you see uh, a step uh, in the chart, and it seems that the Deutsche Bahn actually gives up on these trains, and it uh, doesn't really get better anymore. Why that is, we will talk about later. Practical tip, from a delay of 40 minutes and onward, consider another means of transport. So, this was a hell ride. We've already dusted off various practical tips, and now I can tell you uh, what you should uh, think of when you're doing such a project by yourself. First, organize the download well. The train, uh, German Railway has some public interfaces, two of them um, uh, somebody else already did a talk uh, here and I'm happy to see that somebody else can feel the pain that I have felt and you can look up train connections on your smartphone um, from your mobile phone and in these train schedules it is noted when which train should arrive and the change is state, what is changing, failures, delays and so on. This is a bit exhausting because unfortunately you have to retrieve both in separate queries. And if you query these, you can only uh, uh, do that for the past few and next hours. That means we can't wait until the end of the year and download all the data, but we have to work constantly and continuously pull this data. And this is a very common uh, thing, um, so keep that in mind. So you first, we download all of this and uh, sanitize the data, and the analysis happens later. So we have six and a half thousand train stations in Germany. For each of them, we have to query these two things. Let's say we do this every 10 minutes. This results in 6,600 times 2 times 144. That is almost 2 million calls a day. Such a retrieval is on average 22 kilobytes for the change data, a little bit less for the change data, so we would end up with 40 gigabytes of XML data per day. That also doesn't parse itself anymore. <laughs> <laughs> For the whole year, that's 14, 14 terabytes in 700 million requests. In this moment, the admins of Deutsche Bahn will probably have a heart attack. And when we are done, they will probably <laughs> look at the logs and see uh, what requests I have made and uh, send me a huge bill. Uh, but, sorry, um, but... Obviously, that won't happen, because uh, I try to minimize traffic. Uh, these are points two and three, point two, act responsibly. This means you should not generate so much traffic that you kill the target's infrastructure or incur unnecessary costs. This is more realistic than it sounds, maybe not for Deutsche Bahn, but uh, just as portals, uh, you have to be careful, because they are surprisingly weak. At least I heard so. My solution is that I uh, request only once an hour and only the uh, 350 long-distance railway stations. So that means um, I'm down to about 60,000 requests a day. Um, it's a bit less even when you do it adaptively, and the admins no longer get a heart attack, but they're still disappointed because uh, this is no longer worth sending a bill. Point three, fly under the radar. This is supposed to remain a Christmas surprise, and it would be bad if the one million 
uh, calls come from uh, this uh, decreasal.com server, and that's in the logs. So the solution is to use anonymous proxies and send it via hundreds of uh, anonymous uh, IPs. So when I download lots of data, it simply it disappears in the noise of lots of requests that uh, come from around the world, and that's what lots of people do. Nobody sees me, but of course the data still um, is funneled to my server unless I crash it. Um, that's probably when the uh, servers, uh, when the ban admins uh, stop uh, looking at their logs, and I'm glad to have them back in my talk. You don't have to do this kind of thing for all your data projects. It might have been a bit overkill because I wanted to try the proxy thing. It can happen that you're not sure what, you, what you're legally allowed to do. Most of us aren't lawyers and lots of terms and conditions are very hard to read. So if you're unsure, ask a lawyer. Ask a lawyer to read the terms and conditions. There are portals online where you can uh, ask lawyers questions for not a lot of money and then you get a legal answer. If it's not correct, um, they can be liable. And uh, the result was that I should ask for permission, for written permission from DB. And that's when I uh, thought the project was in jeopardy. And that would have been a shame because I'd done a lot of work in advance. So start by reading the terms and conditions. And point fifthly, try it anyway. I pokered and asked uh, DB if I could be allowed to uh, Anonymous, anonymously, anonymously collect data and uh, then be allowed to give a small community talk about the subject. And uh, they let me without uh, any other questions and whether or not they uh, are really so open-minded or they simply forgot to Google, I don't know, but this could might be worth an applause for uh, DB because that was uh, really uh, sporting of them. Not bad, not bad. I hope they're listening. And uh, sixthly, be fair in uh, your analysis. If you have data for an entire year, then don't pick the four worst months so that you can uh, say mean things about the uh, DB. And check if you can trust your own data. And that's not so easy. And I'm going to demonstrate that. And then you can decide whether or not you trust my data. And that's um, my uh, excuse for going back to looking at the data. So the best way to trust your data set is to um, rebuild a query that the uh, maker of the data would have done themselves. And they have the percentage of on-time stops, and they document how exactly they calculate that. And I uh, built that myself, and uh, would you look at this? It looks almost exactly the same. The uh, main discrepancies are that I measure uh, 0.5 percentage points worse than the uh, official results in January. And in September, it's 0.8 percentage points worse, that's where I'm uh, lacking a few days. Other than that, um, it looks like they uh, actually get off a bit better. Uh, you're never going to get exactly the same results, but um, it's pretty damn accurate for an external measurement. So if, you're, if your results are this close, then you're on the right path. So external verification is uh, what this was, and now we're going to uh, check the internal verification, and we're going to use uh, the times of day. All of these uh, dots are along distance railway stations. It's the 9th of March 2019. I'm going to uh, go through this day hour by hour, and we're going to see how it looks. Um, these points are going to grow in size. Um, by the number of stops, and the color is the, uh, represents the percentages of trains that were cancelled. We're at midnight here, and some few days of the, uh, some few trains of the day before are still on the rails, and this is going to decrease, and uh, time passes. It's uh, night, and a new day awakens. It's uh, 
we're nearing rush hour. It's eight o'clock. There are some uh, some red dots here. It might be due to weather. It's uh, noon. It, uh, the uh, day is nearing its end, the last hour of the day, and a new day begins. It's the 10th of March. These are the last trains of the day. Everything, Everybody's sleeping. It's 6 o'clock. There's some traffic. 9 o'clock. We're nearing rush hour again. Noon on the 10th of March, and we remember something happened that day. And that's where the Hurricane Eberhard is showing its first uh, results. And now it has stopped nearly all long-distance traffic in uh, Germany. I had to change my uh, color ramp because you rarely have 50% of cancellations. And uh, we're going to end this very bad day. It's uh, midnight again, and of course, a disruption of this magnitude uh, will have consequences for several days. We're not going to be looking at those, but we can see that it's not always the band's fault. So when you check your data like this, then you should be sure to use very good visualizations that cover several dimensions at, at once. We had location, we had... Um, time we had the magnitude of the disruption. The best way to spot patterns is our brain, and there's only one uh, high bandwidth uh, wire to that, and that's our eyes. So we're going to uh, do some more analyses, and firstly, I would like you to switch sides in thoughts. Imagine that you're not giving out analyses, we are reading them. And when you read analyses from other people, it's important to smell what they're not wanting to talk about. And for a company, you can take a close look at um, their core numbers. Deutsche Bahn said that they wanted to have 67.5% uh, on-time stops this year. And in the starting, in the beginning of uh, December, they had to uh, admit that they would be below 75%. They're still slightly above that in my data, but then missing the goal they set themselves. Um, so Deutsche Bahn keeps silence about cancellations. But imagine you're standing at the uh, platform and the train is simply cancelled. It's not, it won't arrive. And you have to decide if it's on time or not. Who of you would say that it's on time? I see two hands, three, three out of 5,000 in this uh, room. It's measurable. Who of you would say that it's not on time if it is cancelled? Oi, oi, oi. Yeah, that's nearly uh, all of you. And I pretty much agree with that. Let's say what uh, Deutsche Bahn uh, says about that. Complete or partial cancellations are not included in these statistics. The same applies for other European rail carriers. This is due to two factors. It is difficult to find a reasonable mathematical model. What is the punctuality score of a train that is cancelled midway through its trip? Yeah, we can measure in a binary way whether or not some of those are punctual, but um, of course this doesn't work with uh, cancellations. And secondly, the so-called fulfillment rate of all DB passenger trains running daily is over 99% on average for the year. This applies to both long distance and local transport over the last few years. I can't really um, agree with that because we saw that uh, long distance rail has a uh, cancellation score of 4% and not 1%. But mainly, I mean, maybe this fulfillment uh, rate is something else that I don't understand. But a train that is cancelled is not unpunctual. It is simply removed from uh, the scores. So these cancellations are covered up by statistics because apparently they can't be included. So come on, guys. I 
I do this kind of analysis for my for my job, and I've I've heard some bad excuses, but this is crass. This is the uh, <laughs> this is the uh, final uh, salvation bullshit. When you when you hear this kind of thing, then you know that you found it. You have to uh, have to look here and not elsewhere. So we're going to be helpful and find a way to get these uh, cancellations into our statistics. We see a train journey with four stops. The white ones are on time. The blue one is not on time, and the one that on the right that's uh, shown in red, it is cancelled. So um, they count the ones that weren't cancelled and measure their punctuality. This would be 66% in this case. And I would suggest that we count all stops that uh, are that were planned and then count those that arrived and were on time. This would be 50% in this case. So this is really... Uh, <laughs> This is a uh, really groundbreaking maths. And when you are honest about your cancellations, then you're not at uh, 76.5% and also not at 75%, but at 72.5%. And with each percent less, it is... Uh, much more unlikely that people will reach their connection trains. So don't underestimate this uh, difference that uh, they've created here. And now I want to talk about something important, criteria for success in your organization. Um, that should lead your decisions. So, if the German railway cancels a train, that is actually better for them in terms of their statistics because they just remove them. So, the question is, when is it most beneficial for Deutsche Bahn to cancel trains to push their, uh, <laughs> to push their punctuality score. You're already clapping, I can't work like this. The solution is, at the end and at the beginning of trips, trains often just travel the same route back and forth. So this one starts, everything has gone well. Here it collected a huge amount of delay, that happens. And at this point it is to be expected that uh, the last two stops will also be cancelled. So let's just cancel that. Um, we just uh, cancel the train and reverse it immediately. And uh, voila, the train is punctual again. But the, uh, the statistic improves because cancelled trains are just removed. But how could we measure this? Very easy. Hamburg. Hamburg. Oh yeah. Um, also, ganz einfach. Here's wieder uh, eine eine Zugfahrt mit all ihren Stops. It's very easy. So this is a train ride with all its stops, and we just uh, create these classes: early stops, middle stops, and late stops. Um, early stops are the first three, late stops are the last three, and all the others are the middle stops. So. If breakdowns occur due to technical operations, one would expect that there would be fewer breakdowns statistically at the start of a trip, and then more in the middle and even more in the back. And that's exactly the same with the EC. The failures increase in the last uh, three stops. Um, and uh, for ICEs, this actually fits perfectly. And I have uh, asked two independent sources, and they confirmed this behavior for me. I, this was also in the press, so I'm not uh, telling any state secrets here. 
So we can call this, uh, named after our Minister of Transport, uh, the Scheuer uh, turnaround or the Pfalla turnaround. So another practical tip, caution at the start and at the end of an ICE train. Try to not book those. And for the sake of neutrality, of course, the Deutsche Bahn has an interest uh, in ensuring that the train network is roughly on schedule. And they want to minimize the number of passengers that are affected by these delays. And if uh, you can cancel a train and uh, leave a few stranded, but help others to get to the destination punctually, then this is actually in the interest of the Deutsche Bahn. So what I'm criticizing here is that the only positive side of this maneuver is uh, the statistics and the negative is not reflected in the statistic. Uh, I wonder how many people are buying this at the transport ministry. So let's get back to a few praxis, practical tips. So, careful with ICs generally, especially in summer. Uh, be careful at the end of trips and uh, when they're delayed than more than 40 minutes. And also at the beginning and the end of ICE trips. And I could do lots of standard stuff with you now. Um, but uh, that won't help so many. Um, so let's do two other things. Firstly, we're doing our last big thing with the train data, and I hope um, that you will have something, uh, that you will gain something for this uh, for at least a few months. And uh, firstly, if you buy a ticket, then you can choose between a super saver ticket. Um, then you are bound to the trains on your ticket, or you can buy a flexible ticket, which allows you to travel on any uh, train on the uh, between the destination and uh, where you are. So the following rule applies on uh, super saver tickets. If your connection is more than 20 minutes late, basically we will turn your ticket into a flexible ticket. So now we look at the stops uh, that are more than 20 minutes late or cancelled completely. And that's at least 12.4%. So if you have one of these, then uh, your super server ticket will be magically converted to a, uh, to a flexible ticket. So it would be very interesting uh, to see if we can somehow predict this in advance. Of course, you cannot completely predict this, but there are some trains where this happens more often than others. And there are some days of the week where this happens more often than others. And uh, with all this, you can uh, maybe try to create a prediction. So, this is an example. Read with me. This means the Intercity 2221 all stops at Mainz Hauptbahnhof have a 53% probability that uh, your Super Saver ticket will become a flexible ticket. So 53% were either more than 20 minutes late or were cancelled completely. And on a Friday, this was 50%. I have to make this willing so short that I can save space. Uh, you're, prob <laughs> you're probably uh, already uh, guessing what could follow. So I search for you the combinations of all days, all train stations, and um, uh, all the ones where I had at least 10 data points. And for those I measured for how many percent of these connections the um, ticket would become flexible. And I only want those above 50%. And the result is almost 500 combinations of the day of the week, the train stations, and train stops. These are the stops, uh, the, the tickets. I would not buy an expensive flex ticket if you can, uh, if you enter or leave your uh, the train at one of these stations on one of those given days. 
And uh, you can have a closer look at uh, this later when you download the slides. And of course, this will change. So also make sure that you don't rely on this. Um, because it is possible that uh, the train will be on time and you will not get a flexible ticket. And if you really have to be punctual, then that means the Deutsche Bahn is improving. For example, there was a new connection created between Munich and Berlin, where you can, uh, in roughly four hours, now travel between these stops. And um, this is now a real alternative to flying. So I hope that even with all the critique I now uh, have uh, talked about today, I'm also somehow happy to see improvements. On my way back, I will also take the train. And I will summarize now with <laughs> be nice to our Deutsche Bahn because we only have one of them. Einen habe ich noch. Antwort? So, one more. This is the last talk I will give in this, sen in this decade. So I will now leave you be for a few seconds and let you think about what was the most significant change in civil society of this decade. So for me, this is the rise of the um, people who feel offended. And with that, I mean every political direction. And um, I heard how important uh, scientific skills of nature sciences uh, are. And that means rationality. And I'm really sad to hear that it is apparently uh, such a good argument nowadays that somebody uh, is offended by something. And now I would like to find a culture where uh, we don't just criticize everything, but a culture where we look at the data and present it to each other and then sit together and who could possibly start this if not us. Let's not uh, rely on the media for this because they like to create uh, uh, chaos and um, of course uh, you generate likes uh, the more controversial uh, you are the shitstorm culture uh, let's not trust the media the stars who live off this sort of thing who try to create songs and try to survive just until the next little crisis so I would like to get you all to focus on these topics and get you some instincts as little as I can, the little that I can, and hopefully show you that this is not rocket science. I ask you all again, who should do this if not us? How can we do it together to get at least some of these people who have nothing better to do than get upset on the internet to get them to analyze, to become investigators. If we can do at least that for some of them, then we would have made a big, big difference. 5,000 people in this hall, people sitting next to the seats, next to the tribunes, who congregate between Sylvester and between New Year's and Christmas, where other people do nothing but drink alcohol, get their kicks. Why do these 5,000 people do something like that? To listen to one statistic stop. That gives me hope. I will come home. I will drive home happy. The trains can do what they want. I thank you all for coming and I wish you a very nice... You've been listening to Tom. And Waffle translating this talk.
We would be very grateful for feedback via Twitter using the hashtag C3T. Until next time, thank you very much for listening. Stehen Sie sogar auf. <lacht> Danke schön. Thank you. Vielen lieben Dank. Thank you very much. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, thanks from me as well. Great talk as always. Very funny. Thanks, David, for doing this uh, every time. We have some time for question and answers. So um, please come to the mics. There are four or five in the room if you have any questions. And we're going to start with microphone number one. Yeah, you started by saying that fairly you put the criteria of the DB, the punctuality criterion, on using six minutes at least. Did you try to use another criterion that feels a little bit more sensible? Well, you can argue where you would set that threshold. Did you? And which ones? I did, yes. And when you do that narrowly, then, I mean, lots of trains end up, end up being delayed by one minute. But what I did is that I um, <laughs> took a seamless metric. So seamless for me is everything that's uh, three minutes late maximum, uh, that's uh, not cancelled and that actually arrives on the scheduled platform. Um, that was about 60%, but um, don't quote me on that. I'm, I don't remember it exactly, but it, it was a lot less if you take that into account. Um, let's ask the signal angel. Standing ovations from here too. Lots of people said that for cancel trains there will be replacements. That's not in my statistics, so I, I wasn't sure what to do. If they have a completely new journey that d didn't really appear in the schedule, then it's probably not in my data. If they were scheduled in whatever way, then it will be in my data. But, so that, that means I can't be certain. I know that the uh, colleagues from Spiegel did a similar analysis on a smaller data set, and uh, they too found um, cancellation uh, rates beyond 4%, so I'm not entirely certain, but it's somewhere in that ballpark. Microphone number five, please. Thank you for this very interesting talk. It was surely a lot of effort to analyze all this. And after these standing ovations, I'm really scared to ask a critical question, but you, at the start, on the slides, you said that the train stations that add or remove delays to train travel. But isn't it rather the case that the distances between those stations add the delays or remove the delays? And wouldn't it be more interesting to look at the connections between train stations? That's a brilliant question, because this analysis was a bit tricky for exactly that reason. Maybe the the uh, delay isn't due to Frankfurt main station, it's due to the uh, rails coming in and out of the station. That's why I measure the difference of the segments before and behind the station, and then the uh, station gets the uh, average of that. To, that's, I do this to heal this effect but in a way, so they always get the average. So it, um, it always depends on the uh, segments around the station. Um, unless it's both of them, in that case, it actually would be a, a railway a uh, station problem. But I, I look at the area around the station. Thanks a lot for that question. I, I thought a lot about this, if I should uh, take the uh, delayed delta, but I wouldn't have, like, if I'd caught somebody doing this myself, uh, I would have uh, torn that stat, uh, statistic apart, so uh, I didn't want to do it myself. 
Äh, ich muss immer ein bisschen suchen. Bitte entschuldigt, wenn ich euch nicht da hinten ist. Genau. Da. Back there, yeah, I, I found it. You criticized in the beginning and the, in the middle, rather, that the cancellations do not count towards the delays. But you had in the beginning a slide where the Berlin airport always is cancelled, and surely there are other airports that are under renovations or that are cancelled well, according regularly. According to, according to my data, they're not in the schedule at all. Um, you have scheduled data with uh, stops, and then you have the change set. And when something uh, is cancelled, then that will have a cancellation time. That's the, when when that was cancelled. And that would actually be an interesting statistic to look at as well, like short-term cancellations. But as far as I know, that would uh, look different in the data set. But of course, I'm uh, reverse engineering my, uh, that too. They don't document everything. There's a lot of reverse engineering to be done here. So take that with a grain of salt as well. Me too, I take trains, but according to my experience, the regional trains is delayed a lot more often than long distance train. So my question is, when do you have the analysis for the close or the regional trains? Where are you from then? South of Stuttgart. South of Stuttgart, right. Um, I didn't scrape short uh, or local regional rails, railway stations, but what I did do is I have all regional trains that stopped at long distance railway stations and those are strategically placed, which means that I can, I, I can see regional traffic. So maybe I'm going to do an analysis of those trains because I, I have those, and I might just upload them to my website uh, as a as a table, and uh, then you can have a look. We have some time left. Yeah, thanks again for the call. Coming from Munich, we have a chronically terrible S-Bahn, a regional train. So I wonder, is regional train and metro trains or close trains another dis difficult <laughs> difference? They uh, stop at some of your long distance railway stations, is that right? And then, yeah, that means they are in my data set. So I could, I could have a look. This 90% on time performance in um, regional traffic is for the uh, Deutsche Bahn and its contractors, but of course I should I should have them in my data. Maybe I should include them in my analysis. That'd be interesting if I have the time. Don't expect it tomorrow morning. You two there. Um, on slides 80 and 84, we saw how the DB removes the partial constellations from the statistics. But shouldn't the whole train be taken out of the t statistic? The delay accumulates, obviously, and the statistic would be accordingly better. I killed my PowerPoint here. No, why? Why would you have to remove the entire train? I don't. Uh, I don't quite get that. It, it's nice and granular data based on stops. Um, imagine that if uh, all trains are are on time for half of their stops and uh, not on time for the other half, so that would mean 50% on time performance. So that that's more granular and finer, better. Yeah, but partial calculations are also removed too, right? Is it really the whole stop? No, not. I, I don't. I, I think it's really only those stops where it was cancelled. Yeah, thanks again for the talk. My question is about perverse incentives, perverse anreize. The incentives that the DB is being measured on, the cancellation rate might be better if the incentive was better. Another problem with this is how high the goals are, how high the objectives are that the DB is setting for themselves. Do you have anything 
I mean objectives in terms of how quick should a distance be driven, how fast should a train be going, what is the target speed? I, I don't have the intervals, but I, as far as I know, it, the intervals are quite tight compared to air traffic, and this means that air traffic is more often on time or roughly on time, but the intervals between trains are very, very short, and of, and of course, these are interdependent. So if one train stops on the tracks, all the trains behind it, behind it have a problem as well, and this uh, leads to this uh, fragility that we've seen. Do you expect to continue this analysis in the next years and to see something in this direction? I'm not sure. For one thing, I have work and family uh, as all others, and um, this analysis is uh, very complicated. I, I'm going to have some looks, but I can't uh, can't promise anything. And another little addition as the data. Could you be able to give those out? I don't think so because I'm not allowed. Uh, Deutsche Bahn has the copyright on these data and I couldn't really infringe on that copyright much more than by giving you all the data. But look at the uh, DBS timetable API and then just download it. It works. It's not rocket science. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, give a round of applause to David. And if you have feedback to the translators, tweet.